when, when I was here last in the early 1990s, Perry sang once a month. And this is the first time we shared a service together since 1996. And what a joy it is to be with you. So thank you, Perry, for being here. And thank you, Richard Barnes, for inviting me originally. To come here. Now, there's a reason why um, Sean is not here today. It's because, and you can go back to the bookstore and pick up one of these flyers, He's doing Broadway and Beyond with his Young Singers of the Palm Beaches Choir, which he's the director and co-founder of. It's at 4 o'clock today at the Kravis Center, and just pick up a flyer or just get yourself over there. And uh, he told me that uh, he'd love to see as many of us to come as we can. So I want to let you know about that. So today we're talking about how God what does not want us to be a nice little codependent. That we shouldn't be codependent with God. Now that really was the title of the talk that I didn't have the guts to put in the bullet. God is not your codependent. And how do we make God our codependent? By putting God in a position of enabling us when we're refusing to take personal responsibility for our spiritual growth in our life. I mean, we're in partnership with a higher power, yes, but there's a point at which we have to step up to the plate. I have many friends who work at Silent Unity and have over the years and there was one period of time, maybe two years ago, when um, at Silent Unity they, had, they were getting a pattern of several people calling every day, every 15 minutes. And although there are a number of Silent Unity workers, they became aware that it was the same people calling every 15 minutes. And they don't turn anybody away, but they had a little, a little meeting on and, and asked for guidance. Imagine that. Silent Unity asking for guidance, praying for where they need. And so they did. And what came to them was, well, the first idea they didn't do was to have Silent Unity anonymous meetings so that people who were addicted to Silent Unity could get their problem handled, but that was a joke. But then they realized, why don't we come up with an affirmation that we can use? We don't turn anyone away. But the problem here is that people are not understanding that it's not the magical phone. It's the power that's within them. So the affirmation that they used for everybody who called them who was calling every 15 minutes was, I take spiritual responsibility for my own life. Together, I take spiritual responsibility for my own life. How does that feel to you? I take spiritual responsibility for my own life. And they said that some people didn't react well, and other people took it and ran with it and began to move with this and take responsibility for their lives and engage themselves with their own spiritual growth, in their own spiritual growth, because the truth is that you are a vibration and an energy, but it's your responsibility to raise that vibration and to catch the thoughts of God. That's what prayer is in Aramaic, by the way. The word prayer means to catch the thoughts of God, to set a trap for God like a, like a spider. It's like a, you, you, you create this consciousness where you can receive your divine guidance, you can receive your blessings, you can move bigger than your problem. I grow bigger than my problems, together. I grow bigger than my problems. This last week, it popped into my head. I was talking to somebody, I said, it's like, this kind of a gruesome analogy, but it's kind of like a, a dropper full of poison, strict, strychnine. If you popped it into your mouth, you die. If you put it in a glass of water and you drank a sip of it, you'd probably die. But if you put it into a, a gallon, well, maybe you just get sick. But if you put it into um, a, a lake, you're okay because you've grown the context bigger than the problem. It's a, such a simple analogy, maybe too simple. But the idea is that we're not to go into denial about our problems, we're to grow bigger than our problems, to raise our vibration higher than our problems, to move into a consciousness that is greater than our problems. But Feel this right here. This is the who that you are. Take ownership for that aspect of your being that is right here. Give thanks and be your own best friend. I am my own best friend. Together, I am my own best friend. How do you become your own best friend? By taking responsibility for your spiritual growth, for, for becoming, that, becoming aware of that who that you are and then raising yourself up into that consciousness. And how do you do that? Well, by taking responsibility for your life. I remember I learned this graphically in my very first church. I think it could have been my first counseling session. The guy came in. He didn't attend the church. He never did attend the church. 
but he came in and he was sharing with me the story of all of these things that happened to him. And I would, I, you know, I'd never really counseled anybody before, except for practice sessions in class. So I had some spiritual guidance that I wanted to share with him, some affirmations and some uh, visualizations and some different things. And every time I tried, he'd say, well, I tried that, that didn't work. Or I don't think that's a good idea. Or he would invalidate everything I said. And I realized that his problem was he did not see himself at a point of cause, as a position of power, where he could uh, make a, a choice to engage in the spiritual growth. And so I shared with him, and, and oh, actually I went into a silent prayer, I said, what do I do for this guy? And what came to me came out of my mouth. It was, before anything can change in your life, you have to realize that you're responsible, you're spiritually responsible for your life. And he says, that's not true, it's not my fault. I said, you're right, it's not your fault. It's not your fault at all, but you are responsible. It's the whole difference between being at fault and being responsible. Being responsible is not beating yourself up, it's being at that point of power that can make changes in your life. And I don't know how well he received that, but I learned something. I learned that sometimes what we need to do is empower other people by not getting into it with them. I don't get into it with anybody, together. I don't get into it with anybody. I empower them, together. I empower them. I had a, um, a, a phone call this week from somebody who was sharing with me, uh, somebody that I knew personally, it was somebody in the church, and they were sharing with me uh, that they were absolutely, you know, spinning out. And uh, you ever been in the squirrel cage? We are going around and around in the squirrel cage. And they were in that consciousness where they felt overwhelmed, they felt disempowered, they felt it was just hopeless, and they felt helpless. That helpless, hopeless is, is a lower level consciousness, and the answer is to rise up into that empowered consciousness, but how do you do it? So I knew they knew about the spiritual thermometer. How many people here know about the spiritual thermometer? I've shared it before, we've got copies back on the table in the narthex, but it's a mercury thermometer, a bulb thermometer, and one to 10, everything above a five, is in your soul, your higher self, everything below a five is in your ego. And the question you need to ask yourself is, where am I now? And I ask him, where are you right now on the spiritual thermometer? Sometimes that's a good question to ask yourself. Sometimes that's a good question to ask yourself about the person who's talking to you about their problem while they're going around in the squirrel cage. And sometimes, if they're really open to it, like this person I knew was, you can ask them out loud if they know about this. Where are you? on the spiritual thermometer. So anybody else in this room who calls you, now you can do it because they know about it, right? And, I, and, and this person said, well, I'm at a one, almost defiantly, and I said, no, you're not. One is life is a holy hell and I'm giving up. No, you're not a one. Okay, I'm at a two. All right, you're at a two. Where would you like to be? Seven, okay. Now imagine the thermometer, it's at two, and it goes up, up, up. Three, four, five, take a deep breath, six, seven, and you're, ex you're, you're expanding, you're lighter. Feel how your body feels, feel how your emotions feel, feel how your thoughts feel. Now, how do you feel? Better? Great. Now, can you go for a walk while you're talking to me? Well, I suppose. Okay, so they went for a walk and, and uh, they began to laugh and they began to open up and they said, oh, I feel so much better. Now, the problem didn't go away, or did it? No, they gave it a bigger container. Their consciousness, their soul, their awareness got bigger, and in that bigness, well, it just wasn't that big of a deal anymore, and they got divine ideas, and they were able to solve their own problem without any advice from me. Now, when we make these decisions in our lives to lift up into that higher consciousness, powerful things happen, but we, Sometimes, disempower ourselves with our religious beliefs. Sometimes, maybe we learned that letting go and letting God is absolving ourselves of all personal responsibility. That happens. There's a joke about the Anglican priest in England who was very vain. He wouldn't wear his glasses while he drove because he was afraid somebody would see him with his glasses on. So he'd get into problems. And the constable in the town knew this. And so he wasn't too surprised when he saw his the priest's car smashed into a tree. So he, he parked his vehicle, walked over to the priest who was sitting in his car, and he said, 
how are you? And he looked at him and he said, I'm fine, of course. I had the Lord riding with me. And the constable looked at him and said, well, next time you better let him ride with me because you're going to kill him while you drive. <laughs> so take responsibility for your life. Own your life. Be willing to make a move in your life and to own those things in your life and to realize you're at a position of power, a point of change in your life. Change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Together, change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. But you got to let go of that ain't it awful, that stuck place, that place that says, I can't, I won't, it isn't. Well, you know the one. And I remember my mom told me I could tell this story on her. Back about two years after my dad died, my mom called me and she used to get the recordings of my talks and she said, you talk about goals. I just don't really want any of those goals. There's nothing I want to do. I just miss your dad so bad and I just, I've just given up. You know, what, what? Well, what do I do about this? And I said, well, Mom, what do, you, what, do you what do you love to do? Well, the only thing I can think of, I, I love to go on cruise ships. <laughs> okay. And, and what are you good at? What are you good at? What are, where do you have some, something to give to the world? Well, I, um, I won the regional award with uh, Toastmasters. I'm a good speaker. I said, well, uh, what else? She said, well, you know, I won, the, I won in a, a little... Uh, award in Weight Watchers. I was the one that kept off the weight the longest. I said, okay. And we worked on this and what came to her was she got in touch with a cruise line and got herself booked for free cruises, unlimited, putting herself on cruise ships for free, giving lectures on weight loss. And this really happened and she spent years giving her lectures on weight loss and it became this powerful experience in her life. And you think about this. Now this may, I'm not suggesting that everybody here is supposed to make some huge change in their life, but there's a place in your life where your, your spiritual growth and the higher will of the divine plan and the needs of other people intersect. Before I came down here, the thing that got me down here was I visualized a triangle. What came to me in meditation was a triangle. The apex of the triangle was the higher will or the divine plan. Things that I'm not aware of. Things that, you know, the divine plan is way bigger. God thinks in terms of millions of years, not days or hours or seconds like I do. So there's the divine plan. And then on one corner, uh, one point, it was my spiritual growth. And on another point was the needs of others. And I just kept holding that. And that's what got me here. Because it was the higher plan. It was my spiritual growth. And it was the needs of others. And it's where these three things intersect. And it's not about getting a job. It's not about anything specific. You know, in your life right now, where you need to be, where you end up, as you take responsibility for your life and stop treating God like God, God wants to be your codependent, you start to realize maybe it's to cheer people up around you, your nephew or the person in line at Publix or something like that. It could be something very subtle. But I've seen so many people who turn their lives around when they do something that gets them outside of themselves, where they volunteer or they, they do something where they, they reach out to the people around them. They stop thinking about just themselves, getting out of that, 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 that limited consciousness in which we find ourselves. One of the ways to do it is to remember to pray. I know it's the most amazing thing, but I know when I'm in the middle of something, the last thing I remember is to pray. I'm a minister. I'm a paid professional, folks. This is what I'm supposed to do. But I forget. And my, my first lesson in this was in my first church. Uh, we were a small church when I went there. Not, it was about 80 people when I got there, but by this time it was down to about 40. <laughs> and so, uh, so uh, we didn't have a Youth of Unity sponsor. And a woman came. She said, I got two teenage daughters. They need a teacher. You know, what are you going to do about getting a Youth of Unity sponsor? And of course, I was just looking at this lack and looking at it and thinking, I can't really do anything about it. I said, gee, I don't know. And she looked at me and she said, well, have you ever thought about praying about it? <laughs> and it uh, turns out she was a ministerial school student uh, in, a, in a local seminary. I said, well, I, I guess so. That's a good idea. She, she says, good, I'll lead the prayer. And so she took my hands and she said, thank you, God, for the perfect Youth of Unity sponsor. Amen. She says, okay, that ought to do it. 
I put an announcement in the bulletin. There was a woman who was a special needs teacher who had just started coming to church. She was willing to give up her Sunday services because we only had one service. And she became our Youth of Unity sponsor. The two teenage daughters went. Other people went. We had a wonderful Youth of Unity. I'm still Facebook friends with these people. They're still making moves in their lives and getting that spiritual place and that consciousness, which is that divine plan that I knew nothing about. But I had to get out of the idea that, oh, ain't it off, there's not enough to go around, I can't do anything about it, etc. And sometimes the simplest prayer, like that prayer, is the best. You know, we get all metaphysical, we think we've got to come up with the right terminology. We've got to do the right kind of prayer. Be in the, oh, and be in the right emotional state. I once heard a unity minister, God bless him, say, Jesus was never in a negative emotional state, and God cannot hear your prayers unless you are clear of your, of your fears and your, your emotions, because in God is only perfection. And I thought, that's not true. I looked at the life of Jesus, and I went, well, just before he raised Lazarus from the tomb, he wept, and people said, look how much he loved him. He let his feelings out. He was emotionally authentic. And before he made the resurrection, before he could do his greatest demonstration, that was his second greatest with Lazarus, he was in a position where he um, allowed himself to feel his fears. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, it said he was so scared, he sweated blood. That's a, that's a metaphor, but still. The idea is that you let your emotions out. Simply understanding, you know, this person had said, this unity minister had said, um, don't pray until you're uh, uh, not fearful. No, no, no. Pray and then you won't be fearful. He said, don't pray until you're peaceful. No, pray and then it'll make you peaceful. Go ahead and be authentic emotionally. And sometimes that means just letting it out. Jane Elizabeth Hart shared her story about her daughter who was murdered and she forgave the person who did the act. But she said that what she did is she went into her car in the garage and rolled, had the windows rolled up. And she said, I'm going to put on a timer, 10 minutes. And she let out all of her opinions that she had and all her feelings that she had. But she said, I'm only going to give it 10 minutes. And she did it, and she just did it, and then she spent the next hour taking the perpetrator up the seven steps and doing the forgiveness work and doing what she needed to do. We've got to be willing to be emotionally authentic without wallowing in those emotions. So we allow ourselves to release what needs to be there, to offload it, but to not stay stuck there, to move with the changes, to move with these things, and to allow ourselves to open up to a new possibility. Sometimes that means that we get off the idea that we are all metaphysically perfect in our prayers. The letter of prayers, realize it's your faith that makes you whole, as Jesus said, but the faith that makes you whole is really the love you have for the answer prayer. A unity minister who was talking about some people who were saying you had to pray a certain way. He said, you know, in 1987, I was diagnosed with MS. And it wasn't my perfect uh, diction and language of my affirmations that healed me. It was the fact that I was in love with my healing. And my faith made me whole. And that's how he became a unity minister. And that worked for him. In his situation, it wasn't about the language. And often, I, 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 people have a tendency to overcomplicate things. Keep it simple. Let your, let your prayer be the direct prayer. Give thanks for the answer. Give thanks for the right answer. I learned this back in the 1970s when I was working in a parts department in a Mazda dealership when all the rotary engines were failing. And as a result, every single car that they had sold was coming back and we'd have to crate up the engines and send them back for warranty. Well, every day was many, many engines and it took two people to do it. One person down below to guide the big heavy rotary engine into the crate and the other person to run the pulley. Problem was that for some reason, the guy who was running the pulley, and I was the one down below, let go of the pulley and it crushed my finger, crushed my hand. I was in terrible pain. I, uh, they, they drove me to the hospital, but it was in Oakland at the time. And at that time, there were a lot of gunshot wounds. There were a lot of people who were ahead of me in the emergency room who had life-threatening problems. And although this was very disturbing to me, it wasn't life-threatening. So one hour became two hours, became three hours, and people would come up to me, the nurses, and say, would you like a shot for the pain? And I'd say, no, no, no. And after about three hours, more for my anxiety than for any other thing, I said, okay. 
You know when they ask you, when you go in to your doctor for the first time and they say, are you allergic to any medicines? This is the one. <laughs> now when I tell them about it, they said, oh, they don't even give that anymore. That was horrible. Well, I was the guinea pig because I felt like I was going to both fall asleep and go out of my mind at the same time. And I barely could talk, and I said, what's wrong? And they said, well, we had to give you something strong to kill the pain. I said, give me the pain. <laughs> so they put me in a wheelchair, and they, they wheeled me into a dark room and shut the door, and I'm sitting in the dark. I can't formulate a thought in my head. Now, I'd experienced, and I've shared my stories about my sister, and I'd seen people who'd used healing prayers and affirmations, and I knew I was in need at that moment, you know, that old gospel song, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Well, I was the one who was in need of prayer, but I couldn't formulate a thought. The only thing I could do was somehow say out loud, help. And I was sincere because I felt a whoosh and all of that Tolwyn, that stuff they gave me, left me. And I felt not only no pain, but I didn't, I wasn't uh, oblivious anymore. I was, I was, I guess you'd call it sober. And um, I got up out of the wheelchair, I walked out, and, and uh, <laughs> just in time for them to take me into the x-ray. Now, I don't know what the x-ray was like beforehand, although it felt like my hand was crushed, but they looked at it and said, there's nothing wrong, and I, it was a Friday, I went back to play the organ at church on Sunday, I had no, no problems. But it, it's not the formulation of your prayer that makes the difference, it is your faith, your faith has made you whole, Jesus talked about that. And, Realize that Jesus was totally eclectic in his style of praying. I've shared this many times. There were times he told his people, uh, go show yourselves to the priest. Other times he said, don't talk to anybody. Times he formulated a prayer. Other times he said, I'm not going to say a word because God already knows. So it's all over the map. It's not about the methodology, although it's helpful. It's about your consciousness and your willingness and your sincerity of heart and that part of yourself that is willing to embrace something higher, that will, is willing to grow bigger than your problem, and even if you don't have the wherewithal like I did, is willing to be willing, and is ready to move and grow and change and be. You know, we have to be open and receptive to this. And one of the things that really helps us in doing this is to recognize that right where we are is a point of power is a position of strength that we must be our own best friend that we need to become aware that there is this which is inside of us that is yearning to express and to change and to be and and to give our consent to it and anytime we are trying to get validation out here from anybody outside of us we're really disempowering ourselves we're giving away our power we have to realize that we're the only one who can empower ourselves. We are our own best friend. That there is nothing and no one outside of us that can validate us. That the power of God, even, is here in our hearts. Myrtle Fillmore said, we want to pray to a God outside of us, but it is the God within who helps and heals. And what she meant by that is that although sometimes it feels like God is far away, and that's the phase that we go through, that ultimately there is that presence and that power that is active within each one of us. And it's our responsibility to be open and receptive to it, to give it consent, and to move with it and move in it. I'm going to share uh, an opportunity here in, in a little meditation to try this uh, spiritual thermometer out and to feel what it's like to move higher than and bigger than whatever problem we've walked in to this room with today. So just close your eyes and, and just take a deep breath and just realize that your imagination is that God-given faculty that allows you to move your energy to another place, to a better place. And so imagine a spiritual thermometer in front of you, that this uh, bulb thermometer, a mercury thermometer with the little red, and it's calibrated from one to 10 five in the middle being the differentiation between the lower self and the higher self, between the ego and the soul. And ask yourself this question, where am I on the spiritual thermometer right now? And just take the number that you're at 
And don't question it, just look at it. And don't beat yourself up or pat yourself on the back, just look at it. Be the observer self. And now ask yourself, where would I like to be on the spiritual thermometer? If I could be somewhere and it's believable, where, where could I be in a higher place? And see that, that little red line moving up, 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 up. To that higher place, feel yourself becoming more spacious, more bright, more expanded. And know that through the power, the empowered divine imagination within you, you have shifted your energy and your vibration. You've expanded your heart. You've moved yourself up above into that place, that atmosphere where all things are possible. You've grown your capacity. You've expanded yourself bigger than whatever seeming problems you've had. Thank you, God, that from this empowered place, all things are possible. And so it is. Amen.